All right, welcome back, Powers on Sports Podcast. Hopefully you enjoyed our chat with Ian Hess talking all things Lionel Messi to Miami. And now we are going to jump into uh, back into the college football world a little bit. We're going to talk a little uh, Djokovic breaking the uh, Grand Slam record. We'll talk a little Phoenix Suns with our man, our West Coast guy, editor of USA Today's Trojan Wire, covers all things USC, Pac-12, just a guru on the uh, the, the entire sports landscape. Matt Zemick, back on the podcast. How you doing, Matt? I'm doing great. And hey, Ian Hest is my man. and He's enjoying the South Florida spring of dreams. Yeah, uh, I might know. Fall short, might fall short in the Stanley Cup and NBA Finals, but still. The two final fours with FAU and Miami, and then the, the Heat, the Game Panthers, sevens in Boston in yeah. both leagues, making the finals both NHL. Like you've had, uh, like four straight days: two Heat NBA Finals home games, two Panthers home games, and now Messi. Like just an absolutely amazing two and a half months. So you're, I know, sure. you know, Floridians are having some kind of time. That's right. That's right. And I know Ian's involved in some of your podcast production side of stuff, and I know he does some stuff with you. So good, uh, good confluence of people this week on the podcast. I'm Absolutely. glad we were able to, to get you guys both and you guys are doing do a great job as always. So, all right. So before we get to some college football, let's talk a little Djokovic at the French Open breaks the record 23rd Grand Slam title on Sunday in a Spirited match with Casper Rude, kind of the showdown match that we all were looking for on Friday in the semifinals, kind of fizzled when Alcaraz, I mean, he has to take a major hit for this. Not that he lost, but when you cramp up in the third freaking set and you're 20 years old, are you kidding me? The guy hasn't been pushed the whole tournament you know that's a bad to me. That's a stain on him. That's not a good look when you're when you're when you're cooked after two plus sets and you can't basically continue. Your thoughts on Djokovic and that you know the, the just the French Open and the whole situation with Alcaraz? Yeah, let's start with the Alcaraz piece. Then we can get into Djokovic and his place in history. So with the Alcaraz thing, like Jason, you know that the NBA Finals are winding down and often in the NBA, like how, what's the law of the jungle in the NBA usually? You have to lose at a high level, you know, on a big stage. You have to get a kick in the gut, uh, you know, before you then win, before you then become the big cheese. Like in the 1980s, you know, growing up, like the Pistons had to lose to the Celtics before they could top yep. them. Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen had to lose to the Pistons before they could top them. You know, usually you have to go through uh, the big guys, you know, before – you figure it all out. Yeah. And, and, and so entering this French Open, I did think that Novak Djokovic was the favorite. Now, you know, you know, when you see Alcaraz play most of the ATP tour, like it's impossible not to fall in love. Like <coughs> Stefano Tsitsipas is a role, former French Open runner up. Uh, he's made two major finals. Clay is his best service, like the top spin forehand that he hits. Yep. It's rewarded on clay more than any other surface. So, like, since a pass against most guys on clay, he's a beast. But Alcaraz just walks in in the quarterfinals and just absolutely dismantles him. It was no contest. So you take a very, very, very good clay court player, such as Stefano Sitsipas, and Alcaraz just walks over him like he's not even there. So, like, that tells you how high a ceiling Carlos Alcaraz has, and that's why he was a betting favorite going into a uh, Friday semifinal. semifinal against Djokovic. But here's the thing. Most guys aren't Novak Djokovic. Right. You know, Djokovic is going to ask questions of you that no one else will. I mean, certainly with Rafael Nadal injured and, you know, near the end of the line, you know, next year probably is going to be the last year of his career, barring some unforeseen plot twist. Novak Djokovic is not most guys. Novak, Novak Djokovic is not an ordinary tennis player. He's not, you know, a moderately good tennis player. He's an icon and he's an icon for a reason. You know, he's at the very top of the sport for a reason. And so he's going to get balls back that no one else does. He's going to have a plan B, a plan C for defending you, for countering you that no one else will. Cause as obviously he has a huge tennis IQ and this is, and this is what really decided Friday's uh, semifinal. Djokovic has been there so many times before knows how to handle himself, knows how to carry himself. And in tennis, it's up to you. Like, and, and of course, you know, we've had some 
coaching controversies in the past. Like it's really easy to, you know, for a coach in the stands to wear a cap and you just kind of, you know, uh, you point your finger to the side and like, you know, serve, like, you know, to serve yeah. wide. Or, like it's so easy to give, you know, little signals. But even then, like a, no coach in the world can tell you, be relaxed, just hit, play the next point, hit the ball. You know, this, so this was Carlos Alcaraz's, I mean, he's won a major, but when he won that major at the U.S. Open. No Djokovic. He playing, he, yes, he was playing, playing Francis Tiafo right. in the semis and Casper Ruud in the final. And those are good players, but they're not Novak Djokovic. And so it's a whole different realm, a, a, a whole different world yep. of pressure, whole different level of scrutiny, whole different level of expectations. And Alcaraz said after this match, I'd never been so tense. And like that, it just... He was ambushed. He was ambushed by how nervous he was. And a lot of people, you know, naturally think that, oh, if you're nervous, well, then you're just going to shank your shots. You're not going to be able to put balls in the court. Well, hey, nerves manifest differently for everyone. And in right. this case for Alcaraz is that his body seized up because of just the nervous the tension, energy. The tension, yeah. He couldn't, he couldn't flush it out of his body, and it just all became a tidal wave. Now, you might remember – the 2004 Roland Garros finals, really before the big three era of Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic really got rolling. You know, Nadal won his first French Open next year in 2005. But in 2004, it was a match between Gaston Gaudio and Guillermo Coria. Guillermo Coria wins the first two sets over Gaudio in, this, in the 2004 French Open final, love and three. He was, he was dominant. It's so like Alcaraz was out there for two hours and 45 minutes, and then he cramped up. Which again, as you said, like wh where, how, how the heck did that happen? Like that should never happen. Gaudio, or I mean, Coria, he was out there for barely more than an hour, and he was running away with it up two sets to love. And then the third set, like he realizes, oh, I could win my first French Open, and he just he, his nerves just completely right. disintegrate, and that led to cramps. And so, like, and here he is. Here's uh, Coria in the fifth set of a match that he was up six love six three. He's cramping in the fifth set. He's serving underhand. He's desperately trying to stay in the match, and he loses. That's, like, the closest comparison I can come up with, Jason, to what we saw in the Alcaraz match. But, like, sometimes the nerves don't manifest in shanks or, like, you just ten, a million double faults. You burn it's all just, your energy. You burn, you burn all your all energy. You burn all your energy. That's right. And you just don't know how to handle that. And so this was Alcaraz's first real go-round against Djokovic. At a major, you know, they played in Madrid one right. year ago, but again, Madrid is not Roland Garros. So it, we really keep coming back to this notion of, you know, playing 99% of your tour matches, you know, playing most matches in a season, playing most guys, most opponents in a season, you know, it, it, it it's pretty manageable because there's not the stakes. There's not the sure. of, oh, wow, what a moment this is. But when you're playing Novak Djokovic and when you're playing him in a major semifinal or final, it is just a completely different challenge. And that's why this big three era, which is winding down, yep. has been so special. Because these guys just always know bring their A game themselves. Djokovic is never, their... he's never laid an egg in a final. He might have got beat, but he's yes. never laid an egg like and I'm not saying Akra's laid an egg, but when he loses, the other guy beats him. He doesn't get beat yep. two, two, and two in a final. It's because the other guy's better. And here's the essential thing about Djokovic for your audience uh, on the Powers on Sports podcast, Jason. Like Federer, Nadal, <clears throat> uh, also Serena, Steffi Graf, Martina Navratilova, Chris Everett, you know, all these great champions with 18 or more titles. Like they're all clutch. They've all come through very tough scoreboard situations. You know, they'll win that uh, key tiebreaker. Right. Uh, you know, five, five all, 40 all or five, six break point down, you know, they've, they've all come through those uh, pressure cooker moments time and time and time again. So they're all clutch. This is not to imply that, that those several players that I've just mentioned are not clutch, but here is where Novak Djokovic does rise to a higher level. That's why he is the greatest of all time. Djokovic doesn't just win those tough moments the way, you know, Federer, Nadal, Steffi, Martina, Serena have done. Like they've all, they all do that. But what Djokovic does more than anyone else, anyone else I've ever seen, anyone else in tennis history, man or woman, he will play like crap for half an hour. 
he will not play very well. And then, but then five, six tiebreaker after a half hour of not playing well, he will play great. Yep. That is what, that is what he does better than anyone else. So it's not just winning a close match, right? It's that he can go through 30 to 45 minutes of subpar tennis. And, you know, Djokovic will vent. He will talk to his yep. box. He will curse. All right. And, you know, one of the fallacies of sports evaluation over the years is like if you're a stoic, you know, you don't really care or like you lack that competitor's edge. Like Tom Landry was a stoic, like a classic example. You know, he didn't emote. So, you know, he didn't. That's why he lost to the Steelers in the Super Bowl. That's why, you know, the Dallas Cowboys had so many, you know, excruciating losses in, in late stage games. And Landry didn't win nearly as many Super Bowls as he could have. You know, so like many people get into that. Like if, if you don't emote, then you're just not passionate enough. You don't have enough hunger. Here's the other side. Djokovic, he's always emotive. You know, he's always really passionate and just spewing all this energy. But like, whereas Alcaraz gets ambushed by by that, Djokovic always has something left. So like he's emoting, he's releasing that energy, but like it's always in balance. It's always in proportion. It's ne He never really oversteps. He always has enough left. He knows to have when enough to stop. left. When to be for the done right with moments. it. Yep. And 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 but like people will think, oh, he's such a hothead. How can he stay so focused? But he channels that energy. That's the thing. Whatever the energies are, whatever the emotions are, and they're very complicated, he finds a way to channel them. Like he knows how to do this. He knows that finer art of, you know, you're it's it's you against the world. Yeah. Only you can control how you react. He knows how to react. He knows how to just put it all together and focus when it really matters. And just because he's emotive, that doesn't mean he's careless. It's it, it's like he has his formula and he manages to put it together every single time. And like the, so the ultimate thing about Novak Djokovic, it's a very simple sentence, but it has a profound truth. He is comfortable being uncomfortable. And I'll give you a that note. Yep. Is his signature characteristic. It's why he's the GOAT. Period. That's it. And I'll say a couple stats on it. He's won every major at least three times, which is incredible. Nobody's ever done that. Even with all Fed and Nadal. Obviously, Nadal has so many French opens, but he hasn't, he's only won like Federer's only won one French Open in all his yep. majors. He's won them all yep. at least three times, which is incredible to think. Two. He's on his way to the Grand Slam again this year. He's won the first two legs heading to Wimbledon. It will be so, it will be an unbelievable sight if he gets through Wimbledon heading to New York City to try to win the Grand Slam at 36. And here's the other thing. You made a great point about comfortable being uncomfortable. Most of the time in these finals, he's the villain. Federer and Nadal get all the crowd support. Alcaraz, Andy Murray, they've gotten all the crowd support most of the time when Feder or when Djokovic has been in these finals because Djokovic is a little prickly with the crowd from time to time. He's not afraid to to shout down a fan who's rooting on the other guy. So that's the other part of his greatness, which you mentioned. He's comfortable being in a hostile environment. Yep, he he absolutely feeds off that. One thing about the Grand Slam to compare to 2021 when he did come, you know, he came one match short. He yep. won 27 matches. He couldn't get number 28. You know, each major is seven matches. So he was 27 up, 27 down, just have one left. Lost to Medvedev in the U.S. Open final. The differentiation between then and now, in 2021, he played the Tokyo Olympics. And right. many people thought that, you know what, if you want that piece of immortality, you want that piece of history, sit out the Olympics, spend the middle of the summer resting up, recharging, he was overextended. He was a little bit frayed hey, at the, the end. end. You're right. Mentally going yep. into that final, you don't have the Olympics this year. He's going to get the requisite amount of rest. So if he gets through Wimbledon, look out. It's it's really lining up for him. And I think the real question, Jason, <laughs> is going to be how quickly can Carlos Alcaraz learn from what just happened to him right. at the French Open? Alcaraz has another go at Djokovic. Does and remember, Alcaraz won the U.S. Open last year, so he's the he he'll did. be the defending yeah. champion. I mean, and again, you can see how much game Alcaraz has when oh, everything's yeah. going smoothly. Like, he can run with Djokovic. He can cover the court as yep. well as Djokovic can. 
he has like the plan B, plan C, the way Djokovic does. Like Alcaraz can win with power. He can win with finesse. But does, you know, his he, does he have guy, the mind to win? Does he have yeah, the mind? He has the physical tools, but does he have the mind to win? Exactly. And that's, so people are going to say, well, is Djokovic going to be tripped up at Wimbledon? Is he going to be tripped up at U.S. Open? It's less about the tournament. It's really more about Alcaraz because Alcaraz is the guy who can physically compete with Djokovic. But is he going to be mentally ready if he can get a rematch with Djokovic, either at Wimbledon or in New York? No, I agree with you. I agree with you. And, and Djokovic will be a heavy favorite at Wimbledon. U.S. Yes. Open's a little more dodgy because so many Medvedev, more guys are better Medvedev fast court be, players. Medvedev could be a problem. That's right. That's right. So there's more ability to get upset at, at the U.S. Open, but it'll be an unbelievable sight if we get to Labor Day weekend and Djokovic is still in the mix. All right, last thing on the tennis, and then we'll move on. How about your boy Tom Brady in the in the box? Right next to the Djokovic box, getting the hug and getting the hand, the dap from Djokovic post match. Uh, you know, I mean, like Tom Brady, Djokovic, <laughs> like the two guys who like being the villain, or at least don't yep. mind being the villain. Like yep. it fits, right? Yeah, it fits. You know, the Patriots were the evil empire, and That's you know, right. Djokovic, Djokovic busting through the Federer Nadal uh, axis. You know, those two beloved athletes. Yep. Like it, it, it fits. It feels right. It was a cool sight. It was cool to see him there. I'll, I'll give him credit. It is. Two giants, it, two giants of sports. Because Brady's also big buddies with Federer, too. He and Federer are also buddies, too. So it's pretty cool to so see. That was a plot twist. That's right. That's right. All right. A couple quick thoughts, and we'll get some college football. Give me a thought on the Phoenix hire of Frank Vogel. Monty Williams out after another meltdown in Game 7. Uh, Vogel's brought in. A lot of people thought maybe not him, maybe an assistant coach. Kind of a, a, I won't say out of the box hire, but a little bit of a surprise in Phoenix. New ownership there. Uh, he's kind of a defensive guy. He likes big men, so maybe he can get some more out of Aiton. Get some motive, some some development out of Aiton. I'll let you talk on that. Just your thought on the Vogel hire in Phoenix. I mean, you know, Vogel's a confident coach. Won a title. You know, when he took the Pacers, you know, to Game Seven of the Conference Finals, made yep. some several deep runs there. Uh, to me, Jason, like. You know, I'm here in Phoenix, and like I remember the meltdown against the Mavs one year ago, and then of course the implosion uh, <laughs> against the Nuggets in Game Six. You know, two blowout losses on your home floor yeah. in consecutive years. And just from my vantage point, I think you have to trade DeAndre Ayton. I, I think that ship has sailed. That relationship has run its course. Now maybe there is a thought process from the Suns that with Monty Williams out, maybe Vogel can convince Ayton to stay. But, like, if he convinces Aiton to stay, Aiton has to be better. Aiton yeah. was nowhere near yeah. good enough in each of these last two playoff runs. You now have Kevin Durant. You can't squander this. Like, this is a win-now thing. You're not building for the future. You, you got a two-year window. You win probably now. have a two-year window. And, of course, you know, so the Nuggets are on the precipice of winning it all. When people uh, listen to this podcast, the Nuggets might have have won it. We're, we're recording this on Monday night. Game yeah. five is just tipped off in Denver. Yeah. So that yeah. by the time you're listening to it, Denver's probably going to be a world champion. Yeah. But, but anyway, so regardless of the result of game five, like the Nuggets are close to winning right. their first ever NBA title. Right. Suns have not won an NBA title yet. The, va the Valley of the Sun is desperate for that breakthrough. So like you can't experiment here if right. you're the Suns. You need to you need to have a firm answer. You need to know that there's buy-in from Aiton if you're going to bring him back, if he if he wants to come back. And if if you're not getting the right answers, if you're not absolutely convinced, and if Kevin Durant uh is not completely sold on Aiden, you know, right. this is this is my guy, I'm running with him, ride or die with him. I want Aiden on my team. Right. Like if you're not getting if you don't have full trust in the locker room, of course, you're going to ask the other players what they think about Aiden. If they are, if they do not fully want him as a teammate, he's gone. He has to be gone. And so that and the last, really, last, that, quick, that yeah, last quick, last quick change. Last quick question that about more Phoenix. Than the coaching change more than the coaching change. Aiden is really the central issue for the Suns. That's what they have to figure out. And the other big decision Phoenix has to make in the next week or so is what do you do with Chris Paul? Do you try to package him? Do you bring him back? Do you cut him and then maybe re-sign him at a discounted rate? They're going to owe him some money no matter what they do, but it's a matter of do you want to pay him $15 million to play somewhere else or pay him $15 million and maybe re-sign him for 4 or $5 million if you if you release him? And, or could you package him with Aiton to get somebody to take both those guys 
off your hands from a salary cap perspective because Phoenix needs to build the the bench. That's where they were deficient. They they got to build some depth on that team because they just got they just got carved up on the bench in the playoffs. Yeah, and so the thing with Chris Paul, and you know this as well as I do, Jason, that you know at his age, like you need him fresh for the playoffs, and that's been his big obstacle. It's been his big yep. problem. You know, his body holding up in the playoffs, and like if you're the Suns, like. What what really matters, right? Right? What are you playing for? And like we just saw a season in which the seventh seeded Lakers got to the conference finals with a legitimate chance, you know, to do something. Like they're right now, their roster wasn't good enough. Denver was a lot better, but right, like the idea that you have to get a top three seed to be a top tier no uh, title contender. Look, look, what have the Miami Heat done? Right, you know, as an eight seed. So if you're the Suns. The regular season doesn't matter. Like health, just, health, like health, just, health, just, health. You know, avoid the playing. All right, like get yeah. a six seed, get a five seed. Right. You know, but then like Chris Paul should not be playing more than twenty fifty minutes games. A game. Yep, fifty-five yeah. games. And also load management. Yes, yeah, super load management, and you're just focusing on having him ready for the playoffs. And if and if he doesn't agree to that, if he says I, I want to play thirty minutes a night. Got to go. You're gone. You're gone. We got us. We got to get someone younger, fresher, who can give us more minutes, more value. Like so, if Chris Paul will accept playing 15, 20 minutes, severely reduced load during the regular season, so that he can be fresh in the playoffs. Like that's what the Suns and Vogel need to. That's the conversation they need to be having with him. If Chris Paul is not willing to make that sacrifice, so that he can then, I mean, like then in the playoffs, you can play longer minutes but right like he needs to be basically put on ice for as much of the regular season as possible if he's not willing to do that no, sorry find somewhere else to play gotcha all right we listen to matt zemek usa today trojan wire editor we're gonna i'm gonna we're, we've gotten the tennis and the little hoops now i'm gonna give him two basketball questions to get him out or football questions excuse me to get him out of here he obviously covers the pack 12 and usc and obviously the last week or so the some of the uh pack the new Big Ten schedule, obviously USC is going to the Big Ten, has started to trickle out. And I saw game one in the Coliseum, the Wolverines come a-calling in home game, conference game number one. Give the Big Ten credit. They 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 dropped a bomb in week one, the, you know, the first conference home game for USC. Your thoughts on just the trickling out of the of the of the new Big Ten, which is going to include USC UCLA. Okay, well, there's a, there's a USC component to this, but first, on a general level, I was really impressed, and I think a lot of people were impressed by the Big Ten's scheduling format, the larger structure, and, and the really big takeaway from this, Jason, is that uh, a lot of people thought that every team was going to have to play the three fixed opponents every year, because you've seen other conferences do this. You know, you have, you're going to play two or three of the same teams every year. Well, the Big Ten didn't do it that way. The Big Ten did what they called Flex Protect Plus. In other words, not every team has the same amount of protected games, you know, basically the rivalry games that fans want. The Big Ten varied that. So Iowa wanted all three of its main rivalry games to be protected. Nebraska, Minnesota, that's Floyd of Rosedale, the pig, yep. Yep. Uh, and Wisconsin. And Iowa got those three games protected. But Penn State didn't have any games protected. Because Penn State's still comparatively newer to the conference, um, and and Penn State makes out well in this because Penn State will no no longer have to play Michigan and Ohio State every year, right? Without interruption, uh, and 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 USC has one protected game, one annual game, and that's of course UCLA, right? Traveling partner, Los Angeles buddy. So I was impressed that the Big Ten like like what Iowa needs is not the same as what USC needs, which is not the same as what Penn State needs, which is not the same as what Maryland needs. Like right. That was really smart. So that was really impressive. Now about USC. The 2025 schedule, two years from now, is going to be hell. At Ohio State, at Wisconsin, and USC also is at Notre Dame that year. So that's going to be bonkers for USC. That's going to be tough. But 2024, you look at the USC schedule, at Penn State is the only really tough road game. You have Wisconsin and Michigan at home, yeah. but at Penn State is the only especially tough road game. And so if we're talking about making the playoff, Lincoln Riley getting back to the college football playoff, he's obviously 
going to try to do that this year with Caleb Williams, and, and he might. But next year, you're going to have the 12-team playoff. And so with USC having only Penn State as a, as a tough road game, also next year, Notre Dame is a home game. So USC gets Michigan, Wisconsin, and Notre Dame all at home. Penn State's the only really huge road game. If USC can get through LSU and Brian Kelly in week one on Labor Day weekend next year, then USC basically just has to win its home games and it's going to make the playoff. It's going to return to the college football playoff. So the 2025 schedule is a beast, but the 2024 Big Ten schedule looks very favorable for USC and Lincoln Riley. And just remind the fans, they got one more year in the Pac-12, correct? Yep, this is this it. is it. Yep, this is so, it. And you're not going to, and most likely, you're not going to have Caleb Williams in 24. So you're going to have a new quarterback yeah. situation yeah. to find. But it's Lincoln's be been Malachi. killing it on the. He's been killing it on the recruiting trail, so they should have no issues as far as finding somebody that's competent and capable. Yeah. Well, now here's uh, on just on that point, Jason. Here's the really big thing that a lot of people might not be aware of. So you know, Lincoln Riley in 2023. What's his big challenge this season? It's making sure that Alex Grinch's defense can be reasonably competent, that right. you don't, you're not springing the leaks that we saw against Utah in the Pac-12 title game and then against Tulane in the Cotton Bowl. So Lincoln Riley is a little bit more of an overseer this year because he has to pay, pay a little bit more attention to the defense and make sure that doesn't cave in on him. But he made one very important move, and it got a little bit of press, but like people might not be all that aware of it because this, this wasn't a coordinator this wasn't a strength coach. This is just an offensive analyst. Cliff Kingsbury. Yeah. That hire of Cliff Kingsbury, that's going to be like the he's going to be the guy who is just will always be able to be with the quarterbacks, coaching them up this season. And so in many ways, like Lincoln Riley has already done the coaching with Caleb Williams. Caleb and, and Lincoln, they understand each other. They know what to expect. They know yep. what they need to do. The most important thing for USC heading into 2024, which Defense. is going to take place this year, it's going to be Cliff Kingsbury coaching up freshman quarterback Malachi Nelson and also back, the other backup, Miller Moss, who's been in the program for a few years. How well Cliff Kingsbury teaches Malachi Nelson and Miller Moss to prepare them for 2024 when, one would assume, Kingsbury will then have a coordinator job or maybe a mid-tier uh, D1 head coaching co job. Right, right. He's probably going to leave, but how well Kingsbury prepares the backup quarterbacks this year, yeah. preparing them for next year, that's going to be the most important under the radar development for USC football this entire year. All right, last question for you. What do you think is going to be the story of the college football story of the summer? We've got about two months until training camp starts for most everybody. Talk to me about. Is it going to be what's the fate of the Pac-12? What does the Big 12 do as far as expansion? You know, obviously, you know, UCLA and USC are gone. What do the Arizona schools do? What do the Washington, Oregon, Colorado, where do they go? Is that kind of what do you think is the, the big story here in college football the next two months that we're not talking about? Well, you see, everyone's talking about the Pac-12 and the Big 12 and how that's going to go. And I just have to say, like, people have just not learned to shut up. <laughs> like, let's just wait for this to play out. Like, you have the Big 12 fans, and you like Dennis Dodd, like, gets every single leak from a Big 12 source. Then you have John <laughs> Wilner and John Canzano, you know, reporting on the Pac 12, and you have the fans going at each other. Like, the Pac 12 fans yep. th or think Dennis Dodd is the devil, and Big 12 fans think that Wilner and Canzano are the great Satan. And, like, no one is just learning to shut up and just sit back and wait for this thing to happen. And we'll just see if the Pac-12 can land the plane, if George Klyavkov can get a media rights deal. My big college football story that I don't think has been talked about a ton, like it's being talked about in, at the, in, in the SEC, but I don't think people are talking about it nationally. Like, I think Alabama is set up to fail this year. The quarterback Tyler situation's Buckner, bad. Tyler Buckner is your quarterback? Right. And you're relying on his relationship with Tommy Reeves. Right. You know, from Notre Dame, you're relying on that, Nick Saban, as your go to move at quarterback. Like, I, I, I'm seeing three losses for Alabama with right. Tyler Buckner at quarterback. And that seems to be a very underplayed storyline in the summer. A lot of people seem to be assuming, oh, it's Saban, it's Alabama, it's going to work out. No, Tyler Buckner, have you seen him play? Like, yeah. I, I, average I'm, at I'm best average at best 
I'm surprised how much benefit of the doubt Saban is getting. And I know he deserves benefit of the doubt to a certain extent, but again, Tyler Buckner, Tyler Buckner. I'm just going to keep asking that Tyler Buckner. So yep. that, that to me is the huge storyline at the top national tier of college football right now. Last thing on the big pac 12 over under on wins for Colorado. I will, and we'll get to this. I won't hold you to this, but as of early, early June, has is Dion talking out of his britches, or is this guy can he can he win five or six games this year at Colorado? Okay, if I was setting the number, okay, I again would this can change. Three. I'll let you change okay. this come August, yes. but yes. as of today, if I was setting the number, you know, for people to get equal, an equal amount of betting on both sides yep. that I make money, I'd set it at two point five. Wow, uh, I think that uh, you know here's the thing about Dion. All this huge portal exodus transformation. Yep. It would be a lot different if he had done this in January and February, but he did it after the spring game. Right. I don't think people have any clue just how chaotic things are going to be in the first half of the season. Like, and, and like, it's not as though he doesn't have talent, but you just can't throw everyone together uh, before August camp with basically no coaching, no organization, right. and just expect that to come together. That's not how this thing works. And Dion has not been tamping down expectations. He's been talking a very big game, and reality is a freight train that's waiting to hit Colorado. The schedule is also front-loaded because television networks, like they know this situation is fragile. Right. They want... Colorado to be on TV in September Quick, before early. the Buffaloes uh, you know, become damaged goods. So, like, Colorado is very, very likely to be one in six, one in seven. Wow. The, 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 you know, will Colorado win four games? I, I, I'm somewhat skeptical. That's why I'd set the number at 2.5, not 3.5. Right. But if Colorado does win four games, it's going to be because after two very rough months of losing, then – guys start figuring it out and with accumulated time accumulated reps then in november they figure it out they get on a little bit of a winning streak but right now like i would say Colorado probably won't win more than three games and like so if you set the number at two and a half i'd be split that's why i put the number there if you gave me 3.5 i would just run to the under right away and i would feel very good about my chances interesting 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 thoughts there matt zemek well matt we will definitely be in touch as we get towards august and training camp tell all the fans where they can find all your great work on usc pac 12 and all things is your he's a great matt's a great twitter follower not just sports he talks about all things going on in the world so tell everybody where they can find all your great online content and your twitter handle yeah so twitter handle matt zemek z-e-m-e-k uh, I have a Patreon podcast that that runs throughout the year. So, if, and, and I make it public. But like, if you wanna, li if you listen to that podcast, you like what you hear, you know, throw a few bucks in the tip jar. And then my main job, my day job, at Trojans Wire, TrojansWire.usatoday.com. We're giving you every possible angle on the Big Ten schedules and lots of Big Ten football history. Lots of fun stuff involving Pete Carroll, Dick Vermeil, uh, yeah. Ohio State, Michigan. And I got oh I forgot one thing I gotta get in before I, we got about two we got about two minutes left. I completely forgot. Talk about the hysteria with Bronny James coming to town. Oh man, like so we're gonna have so much fun at USC this fall, this yeah. winter. You know, you have Lincoln Riley and the football team, and then Bronny James coming to USC. And you know, USC Kansas State season opener November 6th in Vegas. Like wow. USC. USC has been so irrelevant and of course in basketball and of course overshadowed by UCLA. Of course, that's the blue blood in Los Angeles and instantly what you now have Stephen A. Smith, Skip Bayless, everyone talking about USC hoops. It's going to be such a culture change and everyone's going to want to be at USC basketball. And Andy Enfield really does have his best team by far. He has Isaiah Collier, the number one recruit in the country. Yep. You have Boogie Ellis coming back for another year. That was a surprise. You have Vinci Wuchuku, the big man who had the heart attack a year ago, couldn't practice in the summer. Well, this year he's going to have a full summer of workouts, and so he could hit his ceiling. USC is legitimately a top 12, top 15 level team, and it's not just because of Bronny. This team could be really special. Most experts think that USC and Arizona are the top two teams in the Pac-12 right now heading into November. 
and everybody seems to think that Bronny's probably going to be a pretty good defensive player. We don't know what his offensive abilities are going to be yet. Sounds like he, you know, most people think he'll be a pretty good defender. It'll be, it's going to be very interesting to see if he's a one and done kid. I know he wants to go, but if he doesn't play well enough and, that, and somebody will take him in the first round because of his last name, but will he have earned that opportunity to be a first round pick? It's going to be very interesting to see the development of Bronny at the college level playing against better talent than he's played against in high school. Biggest thing for Bronny, you know, just play defense and, and on and on the offensive end, you know, Collier is an elite point guard. He's going to create catch and shoot opportunities for Bronny. Yeah. Bronny doesn't have to be the ball handler. Bronny doesn't have to drive to the basket. If he can be a catch and shoot, a reliable catch and shoot three point marksman, that's going to be more than enough for USC. That's going to be his offensive role on the team. And so he's going to be a two guard, correct? Not a small forward, yes. a two guard. Probably two guard. Yep. Perfect. But but the main thing is what whatever position he plays, just catch and shoot threes. That's going to be his main offensive responsibility. And who replaces Shannon Sharp on Undisputed with Skippy? Uh, darned if I know, and darned if I care. Because <laughs> there'll be some bro- there will be some LeBron hate coming out of Skip's mouth when he's at all these USC games. You can be assured of that. Hey, USC has not won the Pac-10, Pac-12 basketball title since 1985. That's really the goal uh, for the Trojans with the roster they have. All right, last thing. All right, so remember, folks, also, if you're not caught it already, check out the Bill Walton 30 for 30 on ESPN. I've heard great reviews. It's playing all this week, so I know it's a, that's that's the rival of Matt, but I know Matt's a historian with UCLA and all that. That's a, That'll be a good, that'll be a good uh, three-part series. And also check out American Gladiators. They did a 30 for 30 on American Gladiators. That was pretty good. I watched that the other day, too. So check that out, too, folks. Well, Matt, appreciate the great work, man. We'll be in touch in August. You're the man. You're you're my college football guy. Great job on the West Coast. Keep up the great work. Have a great summer. And enjoy the U.S. Open out in L.A. this weekend, too, the, the U.S. Open Golf Tournament. Always fun talking to you, Jason. Thanks so much. All right, folks. Appreciate you finding us. Check us out. JPO Sports on Twitter. Powers on Sports Podcast. Have a great week. When you're listening, you probably we may have a world champion in the hoops, and we may have a world champion on the ice. So we are we recorded this segment with Matt Monday night. So we'll know later tonight on the NBA, and then Tuesday night in Vegas could be a massive party for the night. So have a great week, folks. Love to. Tell a friend about the podcast and go check out Matt's podcast as well. All the great work he does. Have a great week. See you next time. Powers on Sports Podcast.